Good evening, everybody. Um, the man who needs no introduction. Thank you. Um, it's great to see so many people here, and we're here really to discuss and celebrate the release of Vince's first uh, solo album called Sounds of Silence. And um, it's kind of appropriate that we're doing this in, at the Rough Trade Shop, because the first time we didn't really meet, but the first time we saw each other, um, was at the original Rough Trade Shop at 202 Kensington Park Road. Um, it was a bit of a non-meeting, really, but it was back in 1980. Maybe, Vince, can you remember? Yes, what it was was um, uh, Dave Garn and I, um, we had, we've made a demo, well, the, the band made a demo, and Dave and I took it to various record companies, and that was back in the day when you could actually go into the, literally go into the office and say, can you play my cassette? And we went to um, to Rough Trade because Rough Trade were really cool and played still are, right? and still are, of course, yeah. <laughs> and um, played our cassette, and they said, you know, he said it's, it's not really our cup of tea, and they <laughs> and so, and they asked and Daniel had to be in the in the office. Yeah, and I was in a bad mood because. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was just about, we were just trying to get the first Fad Gadget album out, Fireside Side Favourites, and there was a problem with the artwork that had gone wrong, and I was just in a really bad mood. And um, a great guy, Scott Peering, late Scott Peering, who was uh, talking to the guys, uh, said, oh, you know, Daniel might like this. Um, hey, why don't you come over and have a listen? And I said, no, 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 I'm just too busy. I'm a, I've got to go, sorry, bye. And then, <laughs> so, uh, and then, um, it was few weeks later I saw I saw them play live at the Bridge House. Yeah, we were, yeah, we were supporting um, Fag Gadget. And that was, yeah, we might talk about the past, but let's talk about the new album first. Yes. Your first ever solo album, why? Well, it wasn't really, a, it, it, it was never intended as an album. You know, I, I was, during Covid, um, you know, I was just looking for things to do. And I started off by doing a couple of internet um, online history courses. And that went on for a while. And then I started working on some tracks or some demo tracks for the, for the next, hopefully the next um, Erasure record. That finished. And then I thought, you know, I had this Euro rack system. And it was quite a small system. And I'd never really. Um, used it or learned how to use it so I decided that I would experiment with it and I was watching Blade Runner 2 <laughs> and you know I don't know if you're, I'm a science fiction fan but I'm a huge fan of Blade Runner 1 yeah. and I, you know you go and watch this film and you think there's, there's no way that they can make this better and I watched it four times <laughs> and on the fourth time I realised actually it was probably better but the music really inspired me, the, 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 um, the soundtrack to the film, and I thought to myself, I'm going to go and make Blade Runner free. <laughs> <laughs> so I went downstairs into my studio and started making these drones, and that was the, the, the birth of the project, really. But it was never intended as a record. It was really just for me to learn how to use the synthesizer. It was like an exercise, almost. So I spent many, many hours watching YouTube tutorials on um, Euro rack modules, you know, and if you into that stuff, you know, it's it's really, really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was that was the start of the whole thing. It's interesting that um, because you know, so, as some of you all might know, Vince has an incredible collection of uh, vintage synthesizers, amazing collection. And um, which all sound great, but you you decided to use the Euro rack instead. Yeah, it was very specific, only because I didn't know how. To, I, I, I hate the idea of having gear um, that's not used. You know, I, I, there was one time in my in, in my career where I was just collecting stuff for the sake of it, really, because it was valuable or because it was rare, and it was like a you were sort of showing off, really. But I got rid of all of that stuff. 
and um, so I made a determined effort to, to try and learn this new format and um, you know discovering the potential of it and um, I mean I still don't really understand it but um, you know I've got a lot of uh, I like I, I love making music for me is you know the, the joy of making music is mostly in the process it's, it's not so much the record at the end or, or the other stuff that goes with it the actual process of fiddling about with knobs and dials and sliders I, mean, I, love, I love that shit <laughs> <laughs> and, and the title of the album what what inspired that where did that come from well it was actually I, it was it, I came up with the idea for the for a previous um, erasure record and Andy wasn't so keen you know fair enough but obviously you know I, I, you probably know I'm a huge fan of Simon and Garfunkel and one of the the, the, the first records that inspired me to make music and, and maybe make a living out of making music was listening to their music and of course the, you know the sounds of silence um, I could play I mean I knew the, all the chords and everything you know I bought for the songbook and and I just thought that it was it, it, I, 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 th I think that the, the, the title says it all really I mean it's uh, it's not yeah. a it's a great title for that record. Yes, it's, you know, it's not a song-based uh, album. When did you, I mean, you said you started out by, you know, trying out a few experiments and practicing and learning. There must have come a po point where you thought, actually, this could be an album. No, no, never. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, I mean, when I sent you the stuff, then you got in touch. We were t talking um, or emailing, or, and he said, what am, I, what am I doing? And I said, I'm doing a few things, messing around. And he said, send me some stuff, you know, just out of curiosity. Mm. And um, so I did. And then he got back in touch and said, you know, maybe, you know, we could release this as a record. But I was in total shock because it wasn't really what I intended. I mean, I, was, I, would, I would have happily just been carrying on making drones. But you sent it to me as an album, didn't you? Or did you? Or you no, no I just sent it, uh, what I thought were the best tracks. Okay. <laughs> This is how it works, you know, in the music business, right? <laughs> it's really formalised. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, there's an interesting... The, the, the song Blackleg, yeah. that used, as, for those who have heard the album or, or saw, the, saw the show last Friday, that has a sample in yes. it of, a, of an old traditional union song. Yeah. Um, who, how did you find that? Sample. Well, I, I, you know, I might have this wrong, but I, many, many years ago, I was working with um, Martin Ware from Heaven Seventeen, um, and we were doing music for it for art installations, and he just happened to give me this tape of this this um, a cappella folk song, and said maybe you can make something of it, and I spent years trying to make it into a song, you know, trying to time it, trying to get the right pitch turn it into a, a traditional song but it just wasn't working and then I did one of my drone tracks and I just thought I wonder if this is, this is gonna maybe I can sit that on top and I I recorded it on top of the track that I had and it was one of those really weird moments where I didn't have to tune it or time it it just sat on this track like magically and beautifully and just just worked, and, yeah. yeah, and it's you know, and it's a very emotional song. It, you know, the lyrics are really hard hitting, and um, it just seemed to work with that track. And uh, I don't know who was there uh, on Friday, but the visual for that was absolutely was stunning as well. And yeah. um, quite interested actually about the visuals for the live show. Yeah, there's some absolutely brilliant. There was some. Who was there on Friday? Yeah. Yeah. Good, well done. Um, <laughs> The visuals were stunning. Can you, do you want to talk a little bit about those and how, how, you, how they came together? Yeah, so I was talking to uh, Richard, the guy that runs the EIS. You, you all know Richard, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I just mentioned, I said, it would, might be interesting to do some kind of event um, to kind of launch the record. And he was really, really enthusiastic about the idea. And... Um, and then I thought, I don't want it to be a traditional concert. I don't want 
mainly because I'm not that interesting. <laughs> And you know, there's no Andy Bell to, to you know, to the front. So, and I've always wanted to do something like a visual show. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, you know, that we it was done very early in the early days, like with you know, obviously with the Human League and the, the very first two albums, and many people after that. But I always wanted to try and do something like that. So I started compiling these ideas for visuals. Some of them I commissioned. You know, I got some people, uh, found some people from all over the world actually that put together various visual ideas for some of the songs. A lot of the ideas I've got from archival, archive, archival, <laughs> oh yeah, from the archives. <laughs> um, uh, and edited those together. Um, uh, and then some ideas were a lot more graphic kind of ideas but the idea always was that the show wouldn't be um, a band or a, 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 an act with visuals it would be visuals with music and we wanted it to be all encompassing which is why the screens were on the outside as well as being the main screen at the front yeah it works super works really really great really moving really incredibly well chosen uh, images for the music and it's really interesting because you know when you put a visual that has nothing to do with the track, suddenly the track becomes something completely different. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, Black Black Leg is the only track with lyrics. Yes. Well, and the opera there. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know where was that a video that you created from archival? Or did somebody else do that? That, that was, was archival. Yeah. That was incredible. That, that was, was slightly stolen, but I won't tell you where it was from. Just just in case there are any lawyers here tonight. <laughs> um, <laughs> Black Leg is 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 a, obviously an original recording from the past, and normally when we use that, um, you know, we have to clear the sample, the copyright, and you know we 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 made every effort to try and track down the original version of that or or the, the the performer of the original version, and we spent a lot of time. We could not find that person who sang the song, or the person who recorded the song, in order for us to get the um, to get to, to get the rights to use it so we decided it would be it was such a beautiful such a beautiful thing that we just decided to use it anyway and hope that if somebody did uh, recognize it they, they would let us know and we take care of them yeah, yeah. yeah in, a, in a nice way yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a very good choice of words, <laughs> um, so what's so a solo album? Um, what's what's going on with Erasure? So yeah, we're um, as I said earlier, we, we I've started doing some demos and putting some ideas together to play to Andy. He he hasn't actually heard any of those yet. Um, so we're hoping to start. Um, we'll get together because we we, we 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 never write remotely. It just doesn't work for us. We have to be in the same room at the same time, and uh, to, to make a complete song. It's just because it's just that you know our chemistry is very special, and our relationship is very special. And um, uh, when we can go into a room with no ideas and come out with one good idea, it's like a magical thing, and I love that. You know, I still I I, it, it, I still get super excited when that happens. So yes, yeah, so I've done a few. I've put a few ideas together, and um, hopefully, uh, at the beginning of next year, we'll we'll start actually formulating them into into songs, and then th that will be an album. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just so yeah, Andy's also working on a solo album at the moment. So yes, expect that at some point soon. Um, I mean, history-wise, uh, do you want to talk about the history a little bit? Absolutely. Sure. Um, yeah, so you know, we we you know, talk about 1980. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm <laughs> when I saw when we had that non-meeting at the Rough Trade Shop, and then I saw Depeche play. Um, I saw Depeche play at the uh, at the Bridge House in Canning Town, supporting Fab Gadget. Um, well, why not? That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I just, I just. Yeah, I just immediately wanted to work with them, um, and I had a kind of awkward conversation. It was kind of a backstage, 
um, small small room really. It was a, a pub, and it was a music pub, so they were, they were used to having bands there. There was a backstage, but I remember going backstage, and I didn't recognise them from that rough trade non meeting, but they remembered me not being very friendly, <laughs> <laughs> and were not not well that well pleased to see me. Oh no, 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 that's not true because that we, you know, we knew, we always knew that Beat Records was a cool label, yeah. and um, you know, and, and even the, the privilege of being pl being able to play with Fad, yeah. Fad Cash, it was was incredible for us. Yeah. I mean, that was the music that we were listening to. It totally was, yeah. you know, this, you know, obviously the normal, the Silicon Teens, Fad Cash, and you know, all of that stuff was being played at our parties in in Basildon. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, we'd, but I think the first thing that we did was with Steve-O, right? Well, well, we, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a historically um, controversial... Um, the, the way I remember it is yes. this. <laughs> <laughs> and various other... So I came to see you play a second time there, and Steve-O was there. Right. And um, Matt from The Ver was there. Mm. And I don't know if... I'm not sure if Mark Harmon was there. We were all kind of talking to each other. Nobody had released any records yet. But um, so it was a little kind of futurist. We didn't, I don't think you called yourselves new romantics, more like futurists in those days. Mm. It was more, yeah, but it was more cool to be a futurist. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and Steve-O was very young at that time. He had a, he had a, uh, he was a DJ and had a chart called the Futurist Chart and everything. And he wanted to put, he wanted to sign Depeche as well. I mean, we, I never actually signed Depeche, as some of you might know, we never did contracts in those days, but he wanted to work with Depeche. And I wanted to work with Depeche, and he was, he was, he was, a, he was a character, he is a character, still he's very much a character. And then he's, he said, all right, well, I'll, I'll do soft sell then, and you can have Depeche, my day, Peche mode. So, it was, that's just how it works. And he said, but I want you to do, do a tr I want you to do, get them to do a track for my compilation, the Sun Bazaar compilation, which is, which is a fantastic, I mean, an amazing document at the time and a really great, really great record. So we did, we went into a studio called Stage One, That's Stage, right, one. Yeah, Stage yeah. one in East End somewhere, and yeah, yeah did photographic. That's Ooh. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when Steve, because we, 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 myself and the band were talking about when I, whether we should, you know, uh, uh, be with Steve-O or yourself. Mm. And Steve-O said, well, you know, if you come with me, I'll get you a support store with Ultravox. <laughs> and it was, and really, that really was a temptation, you know, at the time. Yeah. Well, and in the end, I think we did do a sort of a little mini tour. We definitely, we supported Ultravox at the People's Palace. That's right, yeah. Which was Rusty Egan's, because like, it, it was the whole, it was all part of the New Romantic Blitz Club thing. Yeah. And they did a concert, with, uh, which was kind of more public, was the first kind of big public out, outing of all the, those, a lot of those bands, you know, and Ultravox headlines, and you were first on, I remember. <laughs> yeah. And I think you sat on a, something to do with a stage set and it nearly collapsed on top of, um, you know, I remember that good. Um, <laughs> but they had, I remember they had an endless sound check. <laughs> uh, you know, like headliner bands do, you know, and everybody else got about five minutes each, but... Yeah, and so anyway, so we did photographic, yeah. which, well, actually, I remember because I had the demos, or I had, a, had demos, or I had a live recording that I'd done on a cassette, I can't remember. And I couldn't decide at the time, it was all very rushed, and I couldn't decide which track we should do for the Sun Bizarre album and which tracks we should do for the singles. I wanted to do a really great track for Sun Bizarre, but I also didn't want to throw away a great track as a single. So. But there were so many amazing songs on there, so many amazing, you know, it was, uh, so did we, did, we, end, we ended up doing Photographic, which I think turned out great, actually. Yeah, and that was the first time that we met the ARC 26. The ARC 2600, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Daniel and we'd never used a sequencer before, because we were always playing, we were playing live. And um, I mean, I, I, was, I was blown away, thinking, wow, you know. Because we all played out of time. And suddenly there was this piece of equipment that put us in sync, <laughs> and it made us sound really good. <laughs> you sounded really good playing live as well, I have to say. But uh, actually, funnily enough, so I'm not—I don't want to get too nerdy here. But 
I think there's a, there's a video on YouTube, because I got like three or four people sent it to me the last couple of days, about the Depeche Mode speak and spell kick drum. Oh my God. How to get a kick drum yeah. on a, using the R2600 anyway. Yeah. Well, no, I, I will get nerdy with that, right? Because we, were, we started recording the Depeche Mode album in um, the Blackwing Studios in South London. And, you know, I mean, the R2600 synthesizer is an amazing piece of equipment, but Daniel would spend freaking hours doing the kick drum. Yeah. And we're like, we're, we're all sitting there like that, and it was like, and it just didn't seem to change. <laughs> you know, hour on hour, we never really understood that. But you know, kick drum's important in electronic music. Well, I understand. I, I appreciate that now. Yes. And there were no, there were no eight oh eight or nine oh nines at the time. No, we had a or lead drum. So we, you know, we just wanted to make a drum sound that was better. Yeah. We started off with DR fifty five. Do you remember those? Yeah, the Doctor Rhythm. Doctor Rhythm. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so that, and that was a, you know, a, 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 just incredible. Going looking back now, how fast things happened, you know. I think we started. We did the photographic at the end of 1980, um, and all of a sudden, I think that's the track that people spent on that album. People were really attracted to. I remember John Ple John Peel played it a couple of times, which. At that point, in, uh, for a band like Depeche or with any of the bands that we worked with, to be on John Peel was like Big the, the goal. That was the ultimate, you know, because he was he was the great inf influencer, really, of, mu of music at the time. Yeah. And um, then, the, you know, things just went really fast. It did. Yeah. And then you decided to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's one. <laughs> yeah, that's one. That's it. Well, that's the last question. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I don't know if you want to expand on that. Or not, just really. Move, not really. Not <laughs> really. <laughs> we'll just move on then. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember when you came to play me uh, the demo of Only You. There we go. <laughs> I was in the, our office at that time. It was the first, our first office when we started working with Vince and the band. There was no office. Um, and I was in the office, I was, it was a weekend and I had a little synth set up and uh, I was mucking about and Vince came in, so I got, I got, this, got this tune, this, this, you know, working with this girl, Alison, what you said, can I play? I said, sure. Well, okay, but this is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so Daniel's office was in Seymour Place? Correct. Yes, it was like a shop front, really, so he was in there messing about with his up 2600. No, you know. System 100M. <laughs> already, just to be, you know, already electronically correct. <laughs> <laughs> and I played in the demo, and he just, <laughs> you know, it just doesn't seem to be particularly interested. And weirdly, um, our publishers all marched in at the same time for because they were having a meeting with you or something. And one was from Sweden, one was from Denmark, one was from Norway, and the English guy. Rob Buckle. Yeah, Rob Buckle. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, well, they, we, we, we really like this song. And they said, you know, maybe then you should have a listen. So have a listen I, again. I mean, I, was, I guess I was just, I don't know what, I, I just was, I think I was just surprised, really. I think that was it. I didn't really know what to think. It was very different of, from what Vince had done before. Obviously, it was Alison Moyer singing. Um, fantastic voice. An amazing song. I'm just trying to remember what, you know what? What I why I was a bit hesitant at the beginning. I can't really remember, but you know. But I did think at the time. I thought, well, okay, Daniel doesn't like it, so I'm just going to go back to doing what I did before, which was probably working in the Yolo factory. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, which was fine. I mean, I didn't, you know, I wasn't expecting anything. You know, I mean, it was just I did this demo, and yeah. it was like really rough. We did it on a four track on a port studio. Alison sang it, and it was meant as a demo. Really, mm. and then, um, but then, the, the, as I say, when these guys came in and they said, Oh, maybe then you know, you could <laughs> take, some, take, take, take some interest, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that was the beginning of Only You, yeah, and the beginning of Yazoo, yeah, or Yaz to our American friends, mm -hmm. um, which again became hugely successful really fast. I think, I mean, Only You was the first thing, was it? 
Yeah, it was weird. It was one of those. It was back in the day when you when you could you could you could chart and like number sixty in the charts and actually go up, and it went up and up and up and up everywhere. Yeah. When we were amazed. Well, everything in every you know, I, people ask me, but I'm always. I tell them that everything was amazing because it, you never you, you never expected anything. It was always like next week when Depeche Mode started playing live. It was like, wow, we've got a gig next week as well. <laughs> and then like, and then we met Daniel, and Daniel's going to release a single. Was, wow, <laughs> everything was like like but like that all the time. And then this only you single went up and up and up and up in the charts, and it was <coughs> mind blowing. Yeah, I mean the the thing was obviously everything was very different in those days. Um, but if you got in the top seventy five, Woolworths. Remember Woolworths? Yeah, 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 yeah. They were the biggest record shop in the UK. I mean, obviously it's a big shop, but they, they, they were the biggest record sellers in, in the UK. And they would order um, thou tens of thousands, if you just, even if you just got in the top 75. And so it, it just had to get over that little hump. And then if people bought it from Woolworths, then it would go up. And then you'd get top of the pops. Yeah. And then, you know, it, it just—it was a process. I remember even with New Life, we just, kept, you know, that started really low and this just crept up and up and up. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that's yeah. Only you, and then of course upstairs at Eric's. Well, you recorded with that uh, producer with Eric Radcliffe. Yes. Who mm -hmm. ran Black Queen Studios, which is, as you mentioned, was the studio we used all the time at that point. Yeah. That's where you recorded the Silicon Teen stuff, right? Some of it, yeah, yeah. And he was—he was. He, I was very. At the time, before even I met these guys, I was very anti-recording studio because it was to me that was. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, because it was very. It was too anything that had anything to do with the music business. I really hated because I wanted to have be independent of the music business, and part of that was recording studios. Because my original originally, I was just had a little four track at home and did stuff there. But Blackwing was the first recording studio that I worked with, and because I was just coming in with black boxes. Um, I spoke to Eric, who, Eric, uh, he was a great musician, he was a scientist as well. He was actually at Imperial College with Queen, yeah. and he nearly got into Queen, but he, uh, the only reason he didn't is because his backing vocals weren't good enough. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he said anyway. Yeah. But he was a scientist, yeah, we were, we were all, kind of on the cutting edge, I mean, none of us knew what we were doing, that's the first thing, you know. I knew very slightly more than the band, but only very slightly. He was, so we had a lot of technical things we needed to sort out, and he was so enthusiastic about yes. sorting everything out and making it work for us. It was great, a really great yes. experience, you know. Yeah, he was a, a, an amazing engineer. I mean, yeah. I was fortunate enough, we, he, he and I kind of um, uh, built another studio, a second studio at Blackwing, and yeah. uh, he, he was one of those guys, because I was full of questions. I mean, what does that do, what does that do? What does that? And he never, he was always patient and kind to show me how these things work, mm. because he loved doing it himself, actually. Yeah. And I believe that he was the person that taught you how you can synchronize it's sequences and drum machines together on tape. Exactly, he was, and we don't want to go too technical, but yeah, but that was, that was a major breakthrough mm -hmm. in production yeah. for, our, for our way we worked um, to be able to do that. But yeah, and he produced both Yazoo albums, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, um, the second album was a bit fraught in the making, slightly, <laughs> and then you left. <laughs> and moving on. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, this is all a bit chronological, but you know. And then there was the assembly. Yeah, and that was with Eric actually. Yeah. Because he and I then we had a, a really good relationship, mm -hmm. working relationship, and. Um, I was writing, I was messing about in the studio at that point, you know, really just... Mm. I, mean, how, I mean, how old were you when Yazoo finished? 23, 22, yeah, something, something like that? Because yeah. yeah. when we first met, you were 19, 18 or 19. Yes. Right? So you had an amazing amount of success. I mean, Yazoo was huge. And we were very, very lucky. Very lucky. It was a great record. They were great records. But they, it was huge. You had a ton of a success at a very early age. Did you feel, did that give, was that a pressure on you? Did, that, did you feel the pressure of 
producing and keeping going with that level of success and was, was that no pressure? no to be honest no I'm not just enjoying it I think I was enjoying being in the studio mm -hmm. yeah. you know that was that was enough that was enough for me and um, mm. Uh, and, we, and, and Daniel never, there was never da pressure from Daniel, not that he told me, um, <laughs> you know, to, to make a record or to, or, or, or to, you know, to write a hit or anything like that, you know, I mean, me, that wasn't what me was about anyway. So um, I just love being in the studio and experimenting. Um, as I said earlier, I mean, the, you know, the whole, for me, the process is the most joyous part of of of, my, of of the music business for me. Yeah, you love the studio. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, <laughs> and you learn very fast as well. I have to say. Well, I, I noticed that when we started working together, you learn really, really fast. Yeah, well, I was interested. I mean, I was really cu always curious about this stuff. You know, especially when you found out you found the machine that could actually play, that could actually play in time and better than you could actually play on the keyboards. <laughs> like, revelation. <laughs> And Fergal Sharkey, how was, I mean, Fergal was, you know, the, he currently this, he's, the, he's the clean water activist, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Is a, <laughs> that was a weird one because what happened, I'd written this song and um, um, there was a rumour in one of the pop, the, the, the sort of teenage pop magazines that I was working with Fergal Sharkey, which was not true at all. <laughs> and you, you contacted me and said, that sounds like quite a good idea, actually. <laughs> so, so uh, we got in touch with Fergal, and he flew over from Belfast. We were shit scared because he was in a punk band, you know, and we were like nerdy, like electronic guys and everything. And he came over. He, I, I think he did three takes of that song, yeah. sang it. That, you know, it was absolutely perfect and brilliant. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was that was that was an amazing time actually yeah. but the assembly was going to be what well, is now quite common but then was a very innovative idea that I think the idea was to do like a collaborations album wasn't it yeah I mean we you know we thought well it would be quite interesting to write a song and then to get various people to do vocals for different songs but we tried it for a while and a few people came to the studio and it, it just didn't seem to happen and then I started working Trident Studios in, in Soho with Flood and um, the legendary producer legendary producer yeah and uh, he said well look you know you, you need to get someone permanent so that's when we did the auditions and he came to the auditions mm. and he sounded amazing hence Erasure <laughs> and the first album Flood produced the first album yeah with some great tracks on it <clears throat> excuse me but it didn't connect with people at the time and it's the first time that Vince one of Vince's because the assembly record with Fergal was the top five hit as well and it was the first the first project that didn't quite take off at the beginning no but man we had a such we had such fun recording it <laughs> I mean we, you know, we spent way too long doing it spent way too much doing it but we were really proud. We thought it was a good product and everything, and uh, it wasn't happening. No one played it on the radio. Dollar, Dollar did a cover of one of the songs. <laughs> Why well? Nothing wrong with that, mate. And uh, that's when we just, Andy and I decided that okay, no one's going to hear our music via the radio. Let's let's start playing live. And then we really did play as m as many gigs as we possibly could. I remember, and um, you know, after all the success of of Depeche and Yaz, Yazoo, you basically did a back of the van. It was like a transit job, wasn't it? Yeah, back, back, yeah, it was back to your route, back to your route. Yeah. yeah, and it was yeah, and the, the yeah, the, and the, but also I don't know if you remember Vince, but both you know, both me and you, we were actually questioning if you was the right label. Because we weren't making any connections, you know, you, you know, it was, it was kind of a weird time, really, because the, and it wasn't till, but yeah, but then you decided you did the job, you did the work, you went out and played, and then we released, sometimes, and I remember that you were on tour while that at the time that record was released, and you were playing to I don't know, you played the marquee, I remember, yes, with, with Primal that. Screen, <laughs> yeah. and that kind of size venue. Um, and then 
and then sometimes got on the radio, just got on the radio <coughs> somehow. And during that tour, and I remember <coughs> the audiences grew and grew and grew. And I remember you, the last gig you were due to play was at the Mean Fiddler <laughs> and in Harleston. And it, there was queues around the block. It was amazing. There was no queues in the early gigs. It was just a few, a few fans. And it just grew very fast. And I remember those, we had to do a few Mean Fiddlers to, to accommodate all of the people. And that turned out to be huge as well. Yeah, we were very lucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very lucky. And we could go on for hours, <laughs> maybe <coughs> maybe for the next album, we could do part two of this. <laughs> I just wanted to open it up a little bit to, to the audience to see if there are any questions. Um, oh, God, hands going up. The, the young gentleman here in the front. You, sorry, just for those at the back, I don't know if you heard that. Just, I'll just repeat the question. Would you be interested in playing one of your albums back to back, you know, uh, live? From beginning to end, yeah, kind of thing. Beginning to end, sorry, up to end, yeah. Yeah, I would actually, yeah. And the album would be Chorus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, I think it's, um, I like that idea. I mean, I would, I, I would, I would see a band, to, I, if Pink Floyd were going to play, that sort of the move back to back, then I would see it absolutely, yeah. Or craft work, um, the computer world back to back, totally. Yeah. Original gear bit for the evening. Original gear. Original gear. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, yes. First of all, thank you for your music so far. Uh, would you ever consider doing another Yazoo reconnected tour? No, I mean, we did the reconnected tour and it was fun and it was nice to get to know Alison because I didn't, we never really knew each other, to be honest, you know, in our, in our short time together. And that was great, but, you know, we've moved, we've moved in, in, in quite different directions. So I think it's, um, I like, you know, I, I, it's always about the next thing. It's about looking forward. So, yes, young lady in the front here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel really honoured. I've been a massive fan of yours since I was 14 and I'm 51 now. Um, and unwittingly, you've had a sort of massive influence on our life. And I was wondering, sort of, what are the biggest influences, especially as you sort of change direction? You know, obviously listening about the sort of equipment, but I wonder what other sort of influences have. I don't know. I'll, I mean, just, I'll just repeat the question. Yeah, no, the yeah, back. of course, yeah. Um, the question was, what, inf what influenced your, all the different changes that you had during your career? Well, other, yeah, other music? Yeah, and, or? and the music now, sort of as it changes direction mm -hmm. again. Yeah. So what, what were your biggest influences I, in that you know, sense? I, mean, I, 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 I like all, I mean, I like, uh, this is a bit of a cliche, but I like all kinds of music, apart from jazz. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so... And um, a, a Reed and I, the guy that plays cello on the, on the record, the current record, he and I have uh, had a radio show that we were doing in, in, in New York. And so it was a two-hour show of electronic music, so we had to find two hours of music every two weeks. And that was a way of me actually finding new music. Now, I hadn't been, listening to, I hadn't been looking for new music for years. I was sort of stuck on Gary Newman <laughs> you know, for 20 years or something. But it was an opportunity, or it, it was a situation where I was actually forced to go into into discovering new stuff via Spotify, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> but um, so I'm, I'm I'm constantly influenced because I'm exposed to new music all of the time. Unfortunately, my son is um, a Swifty, <laughs> oh, dear. so. And I like Taylor Swift up to a point, you know. Um, but yeah, so uh, I discovered I, uh, during that period I discovered a lot of interesting experimental ambient music, which I would never have dreamed of listening to like 20 years ago. But now I find it really interesting. I think also it's because I'm a bit older and I've got more patience to go through a track. I don't necessarily need a, like a great big chorus or, a, or an anthem or anything, you know. The emotions that you derive from listening to music like that are, are completely different. And in my case, 
I find it very, uh, very, 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 very therapeutic. Um, can I ask a question about going, going back earlier to what you said about learning about how drum machines and synthesizers got connected? I think this is when we talk about Eric Radcliffe. How important was it for you to learn to use the UMI sequencer on a BBC Micro? Mm -hmm. The kind of the, I'll just repeat the question. Yeah. For those Did you in, hear that? <laughs> just repeat it for the uh, audience yeah. at the back. How, was it, how important was it to learn how to use the BBC... Uh, the UMI sequencer on the BBC... The UMI sequencer on the BBC computer, computer, wasn't it? The UMI, yeah. UMI, yeah. UMI, yeah. Well, so originally, what was, we, we went from using the ARP 26... Not the ARP 26, sorry, the ARP 16 step sequencer. And then I bought a thing called an MZ4, which is a four-channel monophonic... Um, sequencer, which you could program, and then MIDI got invented, mm -hmm. and the, the Yumi was one of the very first computer-based MIDI sequencers, and that had 16 tracks, so it enabled us to actually play, to trigger synthesizers live, in a, in a live situation, and um, it didn't take me long to learn it, really, I, I think I'm quite fast at picking Stuff well, like I remember that. how fast you. How, I mean, I could never figure out the MC4, and you got it in like an afternoon. Yeah. Well, the MC4s <laughs> were all based on numbers, so it's all it's, yes. so it's all based on twelves. I used to dream, and, and I used to sleep just thinking about multiples of twelve. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Thanks. Also, yeah. when you did chorus, you came away from MIDI and back to MC4. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So what happened was. The UMI was an amazing piece of equipment, it's still, and still is, you know. But I, I got this this thing that I'm thinking, you know, man, it's just not the timing of it is not very, it's not, it's not as concise. I'm not a person to make music that you feel particularly. I want it to be exactly in time, and the, the UMI didn't do that for me. So then, I, what I would do, I would record the music, program the music with the UMI sequencer, which was fairly easy to do, transfer it back into a analog sequencer, which is the MC4, and then record it from there. And then we would use the scope to make sure that everything was exactly in time. <laughs> Thank right you there. for answering those. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more. Oh, God, I can't even see. Ooh, somebody here down the front. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your music. I'm very honored also to be here. I wanted to ask you um, if you could imagine doing a project with Martin Gore again, like UCMG, for example. <laughs> no, I would love to do. I mean, we had Martin and I really enjoyed I think, well, I enjoyed it. I don't really enjoy it. <laughs> he did, yeah, definitely. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. And um, the best thing about it, actually, was I never knew Martin. I didn't know Martin. We had no relationship whatsoever. I mean, even when he was in, you know, when we were in the band together, he was Fletcher's friend, and um, we didn't, yeah, so we didn't have much in common. They went to the other school. Right? <laughs> and um, so it was lovely to connect with him in that way. And I knew that he was interested in that kind of music. So I just emailed him out of the blue, and I said, Mark, you know, Martin, do you fancy doing this kind of minimal electro type instrumental record and he was totally up for it and then we got to we were basically exchanging files over the period of the recording process um, and he would you know take out all my crappy ideas and <laughs> replace them with better ones <laughs> and then we finally got to meet properly when we did some, we did some promotion in, in, in LA we didn't meet at all during the making of the record right? no we didn't no no and, and it was really fortunate for me because he was super busy. I mean, you know, they're always on tour or recording and stuff. So I, I just happened to catch him at the right time when he was had some downtime. And um, it was just a lovely, lovely experience. Whether we do it again, it's not down to me. It's down to him. <laughs> <laughs> but the Phil Hartnell album, that's fantastic as well. Will you release that? Will you release the Phil Hartnell? Uh, the, that's, on, that's on your label, isn't it? So, so I, I did a record um, t with uh, Phil Hartnell from Orbital, and um, that was one of those weird kind of my keyboard tech knew him, and we happened to be in Brighton where he lives, 
and we got together and we just we were just exchanging ideas really um but he's also a super synthesizer geek so immediately we connected you know and we did this 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 album and hopefully i mean you know maybe we'll release it as a proper vinyl or something at some point in the future but at the moment it's available it's still available as a download <laughs> Okay, I'm told we can have one more question. Vince, one more. One more. We met at Market Maker Park Radio in New York. Anyways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we did. Yeah. <laughs> anything happening with Very Records, your label? Any new artists or anything coming along there? Well, um, unfortunately... No. Oh. <laughs> Not at the moment, no. Well, Vince, thank you very much. That was uh, amazing. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. I think, I think, we, uh, I think we, learned a lot. we learned a lot from that. Thank you for being so open and uh, transparent. Thanks for coming along. <laughs> Apparently, I'm going to sign some stuff. Yeah. So, so, I don't know where that is over there somewhere, right? Yeah. So yeah. Right. Okay, well, see you there in the queue. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, so for everyone who wants to sign in, the queue's pretty long already, but if you'll have to join from the back of the shop now, so the queue's basically where the stage is.